Hezké odpoledne všem. Já vás vítám na další diskuzi na Global Stage. Jmenuji se Josef Pazderka, jsem šéf-redaktorem online serveru Aktuálně.cz a je mu velikou ctí moderovat tuto debatu, která se zaměřuje na horké téma konfliktů v současném světě, konkrétně rvanského konfliktu z 90. let, ale také z toho vyplývajících věcí, jak soudíme lidi, nesoudíme lidi, zda rozdíly v rase, v náboženství nebo jiné rozdíly z nás činí méně cené lidi. My jsme přesvědčeni, že to tak není. Celá ta diskuze bude v angličtině. Pro ty, kteří anglicky nemluví, za námi celou dobu poběží titulky. So welcome to our discussion at the global stage. It's my honor to invite on the stage Alex Mvukan Tung. He's a uh, Congolese Tutsi uh, who went through an uh, extraordinary uh, experience being dragged into Rwandan conflict. He fled uh, to Great Britain in late 90s and since then he's been reflecting on uh, his experience but also promoting uh, uh, peace and conflict resolution and these kind of stuff. Uh, there's a wonderful book being written by Alex, Not My Worst Day, reflecting on uh, his personal journey through the conflict at the Great Lakes. Uh, it has been uh, published in 2014 and since then uh, it's then been translated into French and other languages. Uh, Alex will give uh, a half an hour presentation on based not only on his experience but also on uh, on on the issue that I've mentioned conflict resolution and peace building and whatever and then it will last like 30 minutes and then we will have another 30 minutes uh, for your questions for your reflections on what he said Alex thank you floor is yours thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. Such a great honor to be here and uh, to be speaking to you. And thank you for coming to listen to me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my uh, life experience. Um, but uh, as they say in English, um, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. Um, I'm going to reflect on my life experience and share what I've learned from it. Um, part of my life, I've uh, experienced some of the world wars atrocities, including deadly conflict. And um, these atrocities have been caused by some form of division or another, including slavery, colonialism, genocides, forced migration, wars, influenced by uh, tribalism. But later in life, when I came to live in Europe, in the UK, I was part of a, a social group that was seeking asylum, who some, of, some people in society view as unwanted. And when I say some, I mean the minority of people who are obsessed by prejudice, bigotry, and negative attitudes, really mainly influenced by some of the media of the us and them idea. When I survived, when I felt that really I've reached a stage where I feel I've survived, I had the opportunity to um, be exposed in different parts of the work, bringing people together or promoting justice or promoting peace building. And such experience has taught me that divisions based on the visible differences, race or religion or ethnicity, are incredibly artificial and do not last long. 
Something which really frustrated me while I was doing such work, I observed how policies, especially in Europe, are trying to promote the idea of understanding between people from different backgrounds. It tend to focus, those policies tend to focus on the idea of multiculturalism, which is really good. But uh, my challenge from the experiences I'm going to share with you is that that opportunity miss an understanding or education of diversity within ourselves. And diversity within ourselves being shared stories, shared dreams, shared interests, shared skills, shared competencies, or shared energies. And mainly also what we all consider to be very important. For example, family. So that's what I'm going to be reflecting on as I talk to you about my life experience. I was born in uh, Eastern Congo, in the middle of nowhere, near the rainforest, Congo rainforest. I was born among semi-nomadic tribe, Katohada. My life here was incredibly beautiful. I mean, very beautiful in the sense of tradition, culture, but also a spectacular landscape that uh, this beautiful country offers. Growing up, I saw so many beautiful things, such as uh, what we were being told in terms of our, our, our culture and our education, our cultural education. But something which was strange as I was growing up, I started realizing that my parents are not sending me to school. There was only one school in the area which is probably as big as, uh, bigger than Ostrava. Only one school. You have to run so many miles to be able to get there. But for me, unfortunately, my parents were not saying anything. And I asked myself why they're not sending me to school. At this time, when I confronted them and asking them why you cannot send me to school, they start telling me about history. And I said, well, I'm not asking you about history. Just tell me why you're not sending me to school. They told me that was my first time to hear that my great-grandfather was a traditional king of, the, our, tri of our tribe. And the, during colonial time of Belgium, Belgian colonial, colonial time, um, by the way, it wasn't a colonial time as such. King Leopold of Belgium had bought the whole country of Congo, which is huge and equal to the size of Western Europe. My parents start telling me how that history is close to our family. My great-grandfather being a traditional king and Belgium colonialists using the rule of divide the rule, they saw all traditional leaders or traditional kings as, as threats to their agenda. And my great-grandfather was one of them. They decided to deport him. They deported him in the middle of nowhere in, near Congo jungle and with the whole his clan. And when they arrived there, they suffered so much diseases. The disease they suffered was, uh, it's called a sleeping disease. It's, it comes from a mosquito called mosquito tete. And the mosquito tete, when it bites you, is not malaria. You, you start just dying as, you know, as if you're just sleeping and then die. And so many of his clan died there. My father was born during that moment. And for him, my father, sending children to schools, coming back to my story, for him it was that I will be civilized and become like the oppressors. And the oppressors being the white people. And because of such atrocity he's gone through, such brutality he's gone through, it was, being affect, it was affecting me. 
And one day, my naivety of happiness in this area ended. It was a beautiful day, really sunny, as usual, and we saw people looking like that. At that time, I had never seen any modern object. In fact, the first time I've seen a TV or a car, I was about 15. And this time, as children playing in a village, we were very curious to see what these people are carrying. They were carrying AK-47. And uh, in the middle of that curiosity, there is a man called Jeremiah who was looking after us, and he was shouting, telling us, please don't get close close of these people. And in the middle of that interaction, this guy, they started stabbing this man in his face, all of his body. And that curiosity changed to horrors, blood spraying all of us. And from this moment, I start knowing how the history which also affected you guys here, the history of Cold War politics, was not history for us, was a present life. I brought this, uh, I brought this piece of picture which I took from the Berlin Wall. Not that I was there, but I met someone who had a piece of it. And just really an illustration of how the, the Berlin Wall, while it was in Germany, in Africa, it was within the head. So the Cold War politics was dividing Africa and tearing it in two parts. Some people feeling that they belong to America, others feeling they belong to Russia, and such division created conflict within different countries, rebel groups everywhere, just because of the idea of communism, socialism, or capitalism. And Congo still, up till today, suffering the same issue. And following this incident, you may have heard those who have read about Congo being the world capital of rape. That is not exaggeration. Congo has gone through so much, and violence has been used as a weapon of war, especially targeting women. And when I read this in newspaper as headlines, I sometimes wonder whether people know what it really means. My own beautiful cousin, which I grew up with, I've written, it was the most difficult thing, story to write about in my book. She was raped before she was killed by these killers. But before such experience, I had witnessed similar incident myself. Are young, as young as nine, where I was helpless to be able to help this girl who was only 14. And uh, from that time, I told her that I would never say anything about what happened to you. But while I'm not trying to compare severity of an issue, this wasn't the most horrific things I have seen. My own family, we lost about 11 people from nephews, brothers, but the worst situation was my, grand, my grandmother, who we had to leave because she was not strong enough to run. And we left her, and we never found her. My brother, older brother, we never found him either. But this time, like what has been happening with the Arab Spring, with so many demonstrations going on, for example, last five years, in this time in region in Congo, and Rwanda, there was something big that was, was happening in Rwanda. Coming from a tribe of Tutsis, Congo government decided to deport us to Rwanda. Ironically, this was the time when genocide was happening in Rwanda. Personally, when I arrived in Rwanda, it was during genocide, and I had been deported to that, that area. And I remember seeing the UN convoy. There were UN troops, but they did not do anything to help is the whole idea of international community being neutral. Like Desmond Tutu often say, when you are neutral in a situation of injustice, you choose a side of an oppressor. 
he often joke if an elephant has a, a foot on a mouse and you say that you are neutral the mouse will not appreciate it in Rwanda million people died in 100 days just because they are Tutsi my brother I couldn't find him there he was in Rwanda had escaped Congo earlier than me they became victim too but something which really related to stories of what we have seen where we some you know what we happened in Europe during Second World War is how the media became instrumental to the success of this genocide the radio kept saying I kept hearing the radio saying the graves are not yet full and the radio was the one being used to find the people where they are for example if the killer trying to find where people are hiding they will report to the radio and radio will broadcast it and the killers will go to find them now this may sound as sometimes really worry and uh, get angry to see how the media often report African conflict or African wars as tribes killing each other as soon as we think that tribes are killing each other, we distance ourselves from what's happening to other people. And that is dehumanization. And this is only 70 years ago, when the war was happening over here. And exactly the same idea of you know, anti-migration, anti-people moving, this time when Jews were trying to get into other countries, there was this huge political movement anti, anti, anti that to say, look, these people are a threat to our economy. And this time, we are seeing, we are seeing other ideas around, you know, migration, for example, being a threat to our culture, being a threat to our civilization. And they asked them, they asked them, othering others. And I've had opportunity to work in other conflict areas, for example, such as Palestine, and I get to understand how dehumanization could happen and it become normalized. South Africa had opportunity to work there too with young people around um, crimes and social issues. And again, when you hear stories of apartheid regime, you sense the idea of dehumanizing others, dehumanizing a group of people. Today in America, we are going through um, a, you know, it's a democracy, but uh, what we do see the brutality of police, the profiling, racial profiling, and this yet is a country that's built on black slavery. But uh, the idea of commonality, the idea of inclusion, the idea of uh, building a cohesive country is still really far away to be achieved. And what's going on now in Europe, and which we all know, it has been referred to migration crisis. And personally, I do see this as a crisis of humanity, a crisis of compassion, a crisis of solidarity. And for me, when I arrived in the UK, it took so many times to be able to have a peace. I'll tell you why. Unlike what some extreme media write about, they talk about, for example, that to people, it is easy to come to the UK, it's easy to come to France, it's easy to come anywhere. But it isn't easy. When I arrived, I was put in detention. I was in detention for many, many months, different detentions. Some very tough, some um, probably kind of a VIP type of detention, but, uh, you know, a sealed detention. And it also took me a long time to be able to have a right to stay. All I was looking for was safety. I wasn't looking for money. I wasn't looking for welfare. I wasn't looking for benefits. I wasn't looking for government to support me. All I was looking for was safety. Four years later, when I was given the right to stay in the country, it was right to opportunities. I was able to go to study. I went to start learning English. I went to do my degrees, later went to do a master's degree too, and which now I'm doing a PhD, but I, 
all that education has enabled me to use that safety as a stepping stone to be able to do other things all over the world. And hence why I'm here with you. And something which I'm finding very disturbing, which is going on now, is how media is dehumanizing some group of people. And using such languages, for example, you know, the language like this, this one, the third one, cockroaches. The genocide which I've just mentioned about Rwanda, it could not have been successful if the media was not calling tutis, was not calling group I come from cockroaches or insects. As soon as you refer to other group of people as insects or animals, it is a green light, it is a go ahead. It, it, it really psychologically, it is as if that such a group of people cannot feel pain. That's what is happening now. And I brought this, uh, I try to use this picture often really to remind people that when you leave your homeland, this is an Italian sculpture uh, artist called Bruno Catalano, he tried to uh, really communicate that when people leave their homeland, there is a vacuum that is created as part of that. And when you move, the, as if you are leaving your limbs. And personally, coming from in the middle of nowhere in such a basic life, which we consider as primitive, personally, that is precious for me. And there is no way I would be running to find shiny buildings and moving away from the graves of my relatives. And that is culturally so strong. And leaving, and leaving my loved ones behind, that's how I felt. And last week's Donald Trump was using the word migrant and infesting America. Infesting. Infesting. When you say infesting, is as if they are vermin. It's as if, you know, they, are, they, they have a poison. And we're seeing across Europe and America nationalism, tribalism, dislocation, fear of the outsiders is rising again. The idea of fake news, the idea of uh, fiction versus realities is difficult to know with young people. It's really difficult to know what's the truth and what's reality and what's false. And as Nelson Mandela often talk about, we need to address such issues through education. Education is the most powerful way to address, to address um, uh, these issues I'm talking about. And we should respond to diversity, as I said, within us and between us. Really centrally addressing our common humanity, cultural values, differences, and sensitivities which is really the core, the core learning from my difficult experiences. And look, this is what have been um, some research we've been doing to test the diversity within ourselves. And I uh, worked in about 10 countries and used the same um, idea. And when you ask people to tell you five things that's really important for them, Every one of you, we have no time to do that. If you ask, as I ask you that in your five fingers, tell us what is really important to you. You will talk about respect. You talk about being treated fairly. You talk about family. You talk about your children. You talk about something really close to your heart. And if you use the same test everywhere in the world, people will come up with similar stories. I've used it in, in Japan, in, in America, with the children, our schools, and grown up too. And that's why really through my survival and my experiences, my journey, I started really realizing why don't we focus on what we have in common. And we look at the visible differences often. We look at disability, we look at black and white, we look at all those much more physical issues. And this is just to illustrate that how this girl is introducing herself, you know, while she may be from, you know, probably ancestral, 
from Asian background, but she has other things that really people are not seeing. She, she may be Muslim, but she may be something else. She may be something else. And to finish, really, I want to illustrate a community that we all can aspire to be. This is how if Ostrava, for example, is developing, sorry to use the wrong example, I know you all know this, um, you know, where there is the absence, a society or community where there is the absence of including others, you lose the creativity, you lose what those people can offer. France, for example, they could not have won the World Cup without so many players from all over the world. And thus creativity is missed. That's what would happen when there's the absence of inclusion. But when you do inclusion, you're doing inclusion, you are doing really right things, but you are not accepting others. That's what happened. Disappear. So I might be here with you, people can, can be here with you, but because they are not accepted within a society, it's as if they don't exist. And this is where there is acceptance of others without inclusion. That is what is multiculturalism mean. In, the, in France, or in France they're still using the idea of assimilation, but in the, in the, in, in the UK they talk about multiculturalism, multiculturalism a lot. But this is what I have created. Multiculturalism, I do see sometimes that uh, it could be the basis also of terrorism. I'm not really, please don't quote me, but I'm going to explain why. We have created ghettos within some cities. So a group of Bangladeshi, a group of Asian, a group of uh, this, a group of Eastern Europe. If you come, you come to, to the UK, that's why you'll be called. You'll be called with those grouping. And by doing that, children are born within those grouping and they don't find themselves within a given society. Because those bridges between us, the bridges of what we bring, are not really considered. And you create a country like that. But look what could be the advantage when there is us as one people. You create a synergy. You create a synergy because you are more focusing on what we all have in common. You forget completely what we are as physical your differences. Of course, those things have to be recognized. They are part of our identities. And I finish with this quote. What affect one directly affect others indirectly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we will have exactly 30 minutes uh, for discussion with Alex. Uh, if there's anything you would like to ask, uh, please go ahead. There's a microphone. Just wait for the microphone. Uh, just get ready with your questions. Alex, my first question would be, uh, you went through extraordinary, you know, very difficult times. Uh, You've experienced genocide uh, on your family and, uh, uh, you know, closed ones. Uh, where do you see the driving force uh, behind the violence? We spoke about uh, media, you know, strengthening the message of hatred uh, about tribes, about inequality. But where do you see the moment when people cross the line and they are able to kill their neighbors, kill someone they know because uh, he lived uh, very close to them. I may, uh, this may be really something that sounds to, so simplistic, but uh, I would use one word, which is very common, um, whether violence is severe or less severe, um, I, is the ignorance. Um, in, um, in where there are huge atrocities like what I've just been describing and what I've gone through, um, you see a long term of uh, 
uh, history that has not been questioned. So basically, ignorance has been somehow, um, it became theorized. Whereas in places where media is picking up on temporary issues, you could even say that just the ignorance that's coming out from misinformation. With Rwanda, for example, there was about 20 years of, if I can use the French word, diabolization, so making Tutsis evils for 20 years. The killers in Rwanda, um, I've worked with some of the killers doing a reconciliation. They tell us that uh, they did not know anything different. They knew that killing Tutsi is normal. Is, there's nothing, nothing bad about it because they've been brainwashed. And you see correlation with anywhere else where there is this other form of violence. is the inability to question information that being given, whether by politician or whether by the media. And I think that this is where there's opportunity for education. Children between 7 and 14, they form attitude that will last forever. And if they are getting the right information that is no based on, on, on ignorance, I think we could build a better future. That's all I can answer. It sounds simplistic, but uh, that's my, the way I understood it from my personal experience. Alex, uh, you left uh, your home country, Congo, Rwanda, uh, for the UK in late 90s, but most of your family has been back. Uh, is it possible to be in touch? Uh, is it difficult? Uh, how difficult it, is it to reach out to your brother, to your mother, uh, to your relatives back in Congo? It's Thank you so much, Joseph. It's it really extremely difficult. I have not been able to go where I come from. Um, I've had opportunity to go back to Congo in work capacity. Uh, the first time I was with the UN, I had bodyguards. And uh, you know, now being a British uh, citizen, the British High Commission will say Congo is no go zone, is red zone, you can no go. And um, I personally, I would say, well, I have two children now who never been to Congo and who will uh, live their lives not looking over their shoulders, fearful for their lives. And I don't want to leave them and taking any, any further risk. But my mother, my brother, who survived the conflict, everyone else are uh, not there. They are still in Congo, and I'm not able to go to see them. I do uh, sometimes uh, speak when possible, is in an area where phone is a, almost a you know, impossible, but uh, with the satellite connection, I can be able to speak to them and uh, be able to speak to my mother. But uh, that's how difficult it is. Congo, it has never been like Rwanda, they have moved on after genocide, but Congo has never moved on. There's still so many issues going on, especially which we all connect to one way or another. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but the mobile phones we all host, hold, the smartphones, I would say 90% of the materials that are revolutionized, this, the latest technology we have today, like this, are coming from the cotton product, which you, you mainly found in Congo. The only other place you can find it is, is Finland and Australia. So somehow, you know, we are all interconnected in that, that way. Um, if I'm diverting from your question. I'm sorry, Joseph. If, That's okay. Yeah, thank you. Is there any question from the audience? I see. Just wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. I'm sorry, I want to ask a question which is kind of contradictory to your topic. It's, it's, it's against the diversity. But um, a lot of people complain that uh, newcomers don't share the traditional value of the society where they come. For you, you moved to UK. I have a feeling like in, in where you come from, it's much easier to see what the traditional values are. Like, and you come to Europe, do you see the traditional values? Do you understand what they are? Alex. Wow, fascinating, fascinating question, and I love it. Um, I really, I know it sounds philosophical when we, 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 we use the word humanity. Um, and it, this is because really we have a, somehow with the modernism, with the, you know, being more practical, being rational. Um, as soon as you start using the word humanity, um, we, we, we kind of ask as if we are theorizing, we are philosophizing. Um, but um, I think 
what I can see is humanity values everywhere. Humanity values exist everywhere. But what often takes those humanity out in modern society, for example, in Britain, as you, you ask, is often different type of policies responding to the issues of diversity or no diversity. Um, I'll just give you an example. In Britain, in the 60s, they were at the same level as in France. They were talking about assimilation. Late in the 70s in Britain, they started talking about inclusion. But inclusion at that time was really kind of like a, you know, a, a way of making sure that the disabled children, like autistic children, are included. So that was not the right explanation of what inclusion is. Was it about other people from other colors? No. It was just something to do something nice. And later, they start talking about equality, race equality. That has gone to, but at least there is a teeth to it. It left a law. You know, that's why many companies will say, well, we want to make sure that we are equal. We are offering equal opportunity. And later, they start talking about community, uh, sorry, multiculturalism with, during Brit, Brit, Tony Blair time. And later, they start talking about multiculturalism. Oh, no, no, sorry, community cohesion. And now, academics have started questioning all of it. And for me, I'm saying that diversity within ourselves could be the absence, exactly the absence of those values, traditional values you are talking about. With, where society has lost the traditional values is the time to start looking at, well, we as individuals, what, what, what do we share? Why other identities have been much more powerful than the, what, the things we have? But you're definitely right. In a community such as in Africa, those traditional values are still very strong. But my optimism is that societies where individualism is incredibly so strong, it doesn't mean that those assets within ourselves cannot be explored. So in answer to your question, yes, you're right. Um, you can't see much. But if you look beyond uh, what we should see as the traditional values, you could see that humanity values, for example, the idea of hope, the idea of joy, the idea of love, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, um, all those values we all, if you go to Mongolia, you go to China, those things will resonate in people's life. And if we start really seeing those things which are not necessarily cultural, you will see that every society has them. I think that may be a vague question, but, uh, you know, that's what I can say. Maybe I'm make too ideal, idealistic, but something that has such a joy, hope, compassion, um, you know, uh, all those type of values, you will see them in any society. Is there any other question? I see. Just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, hello. Uh, I've read some articles like about Rwanda that you said that, uh, that Rwanda moved further uh, compared to, to Congo and like Rwanda is called like uh, Switzerland in Africa or something but uh, the uh, genocide is like still hot topic in the society and I think that it's like still it is very important to talk about it you know because I think it, it can happen, it can happen again. Can you share your uh, opinion, your view on it or something like this? Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think you, I totally agree. I think um, something because it has happened, for example, uh, you know, during Second World War, there was uh, the world leaders declared never again. But uh, just uh, years, no, 20 years later, we saw former, former Yugoslavia, uh, we, later Sudan with Dafu, and later, you know, Rwanda, where Rwanda was the same time with uh, Yugoslavia, and um, so many other places, you know, for example, what's happening in Palestine, in Israel, I know it's very controversial, um, but for me, working there, I see a genocide. I see that there's something else going on here. 
um, so many other places. You see, there are things happening. But genocide in a definition, when um, Lemkin, I can't remember, his, uh, Frank, uh, Frank Lemkin, I think, when he came up with the idea of genocide in 1948, the definition was the intent to kill and destroy one group of people. But my, my problem with that definition is that it has moved on to start quantifying. So if a killers have not killed one million of people, then it's not a genocide. For example, in Rwanda, we, I, I was involved in so much campaign trying to convince people that it has happened. Genocide has happened. In Congo, we cannot even talk about genocide. They use, despite that four million people died there, and during King Leopold, nine million died there, but they cannot talk about genocide because it was just, uh, you know, consequences of war or diseases that are happening because of conflict. And I don't know whether I understood properly your question, but uh, yes, I do see that all the ideas of us and them, bigotries, the attitudes, what is happening with the Trumpism, I'm sorry if you, are, you, know, uh, you find this offensive, but uh, I can see a civil war happening in America. And I can see that. And just, you know, if anything would happen, uh, you know, uh, following such uh, the speeches and education going on, the attitude that is living, we are not very distant to that. And I'm not trying to scare people, but uh, this is important that we need to be concerned that anything else can happen. Maybe that was, uh, I hope this was your question. Another question? There's one. Hello, uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, the situation right now in Congo is not really optimistic. Uh, the elections are hopefully coming in December. Um, there is the whole war in Kasai. How do you think it can actually be a good resolution? Uh, I don't really see it coming. So what do you think can help? How do you think the elections can go? Oh, thank you so much for, for, for the, the question. Um, it's very close to home, such a question. Um, and in my uh, part of my professional life, I do political and, and security analysis on Congo, and I'm going there in two weeks. Um, and just only last few days, I was, uh, I was at the African Research Institute, uh, you know, people asking the similar question. Um, for Everyone who are frustrated, like all of us, frustrated about Congo, um, about the mess for a long time. Um, let me just uh, say something which is really positive. Congo, unlike any other conflict that we know that's so complex, Congolese conflict are not ideological, are so easy to address. But what has happened because of the size of the country and because of complexity of um, the history of Congo, for example, I don't want to bore you, but uh, uh, what uh, Congo was really the, you know, was really the hub of the Cold War politics I was talking about. And because of that, really they made sure they give us a dictator who ruled for 35 years. And following the dictatorship, there was another guy who came Kabila's father, um, he came with the hope that he would be the good one. And he was assassinated in two years because he was not the good one. He straight away he was connecting with the Moscow, and um, then, uh, you know, assassination, I don't know what happened, so many conspiracy. But then his, his son, um, really what I see personally as a problem of Congo is there have been so much intervention focusing on power sharing. They see groups exactly like what I was saying, you know, this tribe, tribe killing each other. We need to bring those political opponents together so they can form government. But what they have forgotten to do, all interventions, so many solutions in Congo, they forgot that actually conflicts are locally rooted, but no ideological. They can be fixed. 
um, for example, the issue of land, the issue of uh, legacy of, of law uh, that the uh, Belgian has left, which have never been changed, the issue of identity and citizenship. All those things are really manipulated by politicians at local level, making Congolese conflict being very easy to fix. But because of so many solutions, they become layers, layers of solutions that are not applicable. It's exactly like building a beautiful roof on a crumbling house. So going to election, um, I do think that Kabila, Joseph Kabila is, uh, is really is not going. He, he wanted to use any other excuse like any other politician and any, any other you know, leaders who were extending their mandate. And um, the Kasai conflict is one of our ways of uh, creating, you know, can, can manipulating local issues so that if there is a, about 40%, for example, of where people are killing each other, uh, places where people are killing each other. Therefore, there's no way you can organize election. And um, I do think that so much money Europe has put in Congo, uh, if they can go to the white issue, you, you know, if someone is complaining headache, you don't go to, uh, you know, treat head, treat a leg. And that's what has been happening with the Congo. They are treating wrong issues. Wrong issue as a local and the you know, Congolese are uh, incredibly resilient. And I think, um, you know, if you are in the aid agency, the, the advice I can give to anyone is to focus on grassroots level, no government. Government, they want to be there. Thank you. Long answer, I'm so sorry. We discussed uh, uh, Congo with uh, Alex. Uh, uh, how do we relate uh, to this conflict? Uh, and we just, you know, came up uh, with a s simple information that everybody knows that we are all involved in, in Congolese conflict by using our cell phones uh, because of cobalt, because of our other resources, just uh, to remind everybody that we are interconnected, uh, that we have to pay attention to the companies that uh, sell or buy, uh, you know, resources from Congo because it's part of the problem. So we are all part of the problem. Uh, being visible in, in Congo. Uh, is there any other question? There's, there's the guy. Thank you. Uh, hello, sir. Hi, thank you. I would like to ask uh, you uh, about how do you see the current situation in Rwanda? Because uh, for me, it's a very special case because, you know, there was genocide and other problems, but now, Rwanda is one of the most developed countries in Africa, and uh, it's it's very stable as well. So it it looks, you know, it may look that everything is perfect there right now. But uh, uh, from my point of view, it's uh, the situation is very problematic uh, because you you look at uh, President Paul Kagame, which uh, has been uh, in power for many many years, and he has been re-elected uh, for many times, and. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, or, or maybe he's trying to say uh, that uh, the people of Rwanda actually need him, they, that they need uh, one strong leader that uh, will try to you know, keep the country together and uh, keep it stable. And you know, I'm wondering uh, if uh, from your point of view, is, is that the case that those uh, people in Rwanda, they actually need uh, just one strong leader, or is there any chance that uh, after President uh, Paul Kagame will leave, that uh, there will be uh, uh, the kind of democracy we know from Europe, you know, like uh, many different political country, uh, parties and uh, the possibility to have a different political view, because this is something that the current Rwanda actually miss. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, really, is it, is, is it, is it a difficult one? Um, so many African presidents have extended their mandate. Um, but um, every country is unique. Every country is unique. Uh, I, I try to, I'm going to be subjective here. And um, I declare that subjectivity already before I answer the question. So you will see my view in different perspective. Having oh, that subjectivity I'm trying to use is having known Rwanda. I wasn't there during the genocide. And I do remember when I started university, uh, I was about 19 or 20, 
when I started university, we were so in denial. We, bodies were all over the place. In lecture theater, we literally had to, put, to pull dead bodies, and we can pull chairs, we were smelling, and pull chair, chairs and lecture can start. Lecturers had been killed, judges killed, teachers were killed, even witnesses have been killed. And the only, at that time when I started, we were kind of like the new cadre, as they say in French. The new, the new, the, the country is kind of like a forming a new people who are going to be, you know, kind of helping the country. Being a Tutsi, I took advantage of it, even if I was not Rwandan fully. Um, I was just Rwandan by the fact that a link with, with them and their genocide and ethnicity. And I saw Rwanda from that level where all ministries had been destroyed. And for two years, government was working voluntary. Everyone was working voluntary. And they were saying, look, the rest of the world has, forgotten, has for, forgotten us. At that time, Kagame, of course, was um, a hero because he stopped genocide. Now, moving on, um, how they justify that, I found this incredible. I went back at that time because my heart was, you know, where my family is. I went back to Congo. And the story, as I had to rush, well, the story is that I came back from Congo going to the UK. But going back to Rwanda at that time, because it was still unstable, there was still so many pockets of rebels in Rwanda. Rwanda was you not know, fully peaceful. It was just a Kigali, really Kigali. Even if they were saying, well, we have stopped genocide. And, um, you know, going back to what I was saying, when I go back to Rwanda now and see, every, knowing the country, how small it is, and knowing even the, the whole mass graves, where we were digging mass graves in hospitals, around hospitals, there were a lot of mass graves. And seeing that picture and the picture of today, I, I say, this man, honestly, um, this is incredible. This is a miracle. Out of a, a small country so poor, have nothing, no resources. And I remember their involvement in Congo, which I cannot justify at all, um, they talk about, you know, their own safety. They say, look, we know that people who fled in Congo, they're going to attack us, and that's why we follow them in Congo. Um, and at that time, I spoke out against them. I said, look, you know, you are using a Tutsi community in Congo to lie that you are going to save them, but actually you are going to for other reasons. Anyway, that's not your question. So for me, I do see him has been really a man of integrity, in terms of a corruption, corruption free, or in terms of a bringing a Tutsi and Hutu together, exactly like Nelson Mandela did, he's managed to do that tick box. And for a country that's um, 100,000 of people in prison were suspected to be killers, at least one in four people in Rwanda had killed. At least every corner of Rwanda area, somehow something has happened on it. And if you look at that picture that, that this guy has done this, um, I think he's in probably uh, similar to other leaders saying, well, what he has not done is probably preparing, which way I agree with you, how do you prepare the exit? How do you prepare what you have done so that there's no another genocide? You build, I think he's saying he's building strong institutions that are not based on ethnicity, strong governance systems, that may not take back the country. But uh, I don't know. That's the answer. I think he has not yet prepared the future. What if something happened to him? He has been, the, you know, the one-man show doing an incredible good job. But, uh, you know, we don't know the future. So that's where I agree with you. Subjectivity, but come back to your, to your objectivity, well, to your question, which of a concern. Alex, we have a, a space for last uh, question. There's a wonderful book uh, written by you in 2014, not my worst day. I uh, recommend it to everyone. Uh, I have some copies here. Yeah. Great. Uh, was there any particular reaction to your book? Uh, anything that was uh, emotional for you? Anything that, that was strong? Uh, just give us... Uh, some idea on that and perhaps uh, some recommendation for the people if they want to know more about your story and about your reflections where they can find something. 
I really never thought I would write my story because uh, in, a, in a place where I come from, traditionally, we don't say I. And what writing autobiography is as if you're saying I. And we say we. And when I was writing, um, it was because uh, uh, BBC had launched um, a competition, a well, kind of competition. They launched searching for extraordinary stories from ordinary people. And a friend of mine, actually from uh, here, it's incredible, that's it, and I now remember. She said to me, look, you know, uh, well, when I say here, no, I about here in Czech Republic. She said to me, Alex, you don't say anything about you, and, but uh, I've read a lot about where you come from. I know, I know there's something you always hide, and um, you, you often hide. And um, she insisted, that, look, can you send a short story, a synopsis to BBC, and see, you know, just do it. I did it being polite. I sent it, and I saw my story being shortlisted from 8,000 nationally to Final 15. And when Final 15 were broadcasted um, as a documentary, I started thinking, well, I have two beautiful girls who no, have no clue of what happened to me. And I said I'm going to write for them. And I, I started writing, telling the computer, because I didn't want anyone to see the, what I've written. I was thinking, I'm writing on computer. When they grow up, they will read what I've written, a manuscript on computer. I didn't think about or publishing. But by the time I started kind of referring my manuscript to you know, people like Joseph to read for me, they were telling me, you need to do something about it. You need to get it out. And I started getting a little bit used to it. But to come back to your question, really something that was more painful to do, I kept distancing myself from my experience because I realized it was my first time to deal with it. I had no healed to deal with what I've seen, the atrocity, seeing my friends, Freddy's fathers and brothers uh, being killed just a few meters from us, witnessing the rape I've talked about, and many other such stories. I had never dealt with it. And for me, I, you know, that was really a moment of healing. And once the book was out, I felt embarrassed about it because my friends didn't know about me. I was kind of like a, an enigma, a, someone, you know, after 13 years, you never told us about anything about you. But anyway, I think maybe the, 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 what you're saying, that us funny stories too, because I was referring to my upbringing, but also funny story, him, humors, even in a situation that's you know, supposed to be laughable, as a way of resilience, as a way of uh, keep it going. So that's what I can say about the book, but it's, uh, it's just gone up to life when I came to the Britain, and um, it's a tribute to my friends who did not survive like me. I was in charge of surgery, I was lucky, to be speaking five languages at that time, well, I still do, um, it's as if I've lost them, but um, the recruiters, those people recruited us. They picked me because my physical future, my face doesn't look typical Tutsi. And because of that, I could not be recognized by enemies. And secondly, they picked me because I speak languages. They also picked me because they thought, you know, I could walk differently and the people would know me. Know me. I went into spying, and um, when I look back and I realize that most of the other young people I was with, they never survived. And I took the opportunity to say, look, I'm going to use every minute of my life to give back to the community. Because if they were there, they would do the same. So that's why I've written that. Thank you. Alex, Thank you. thanks for joining us. Thanks for your wonderful speech. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for coming to Ostrava. We thank you all for joining us for this wonderful discussion. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. So thank you. 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 Thank you.